Hi, and welcome to Fair Perspectives, the official podcast of the pro-human movement brought to you by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I'm your host, Angel Eduardo, and I'll be flying solo today while my co-host, Melissa Chen, is away. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Erica Anderson. Erica is a clinical psychologist and transgender woman, best known for her work on sexual and gender identity for teens. She has over 40 years of experience working at multiple healthcare facilities and is now an advocate for safe and well-informed transitions for those experiencing gender dysphoria. We discuss her background as a clinician and as a transgender woman, the definitions of sex and gender and how they relate, the difficulty discussing the topics of gender, sex, and transgenderism in our discourse and social media, gender stereotypes and gender essentialism, the difficulties and challenges regarding gender-affirming care, peer influence regarding transgender youth, and how concerned people on all sides of these issues can approach these conversations more productively. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Erica Anderson. Dr. Erica Anderson, thank you so much for joining us on Fair Perspectives. It's my pleasure. So it's been, I think, a long time coming. We've been, we've been trying to get you on the podcast for a little while. I've been super interested to talk to you for quite a while. Um, you've been making some noise in, in the public sphere for a little bit, at least I, I came to notice your your presence um, through a couple of articles, one for the LA Times, one for the Washington Post, where you're prominently featured. And, you know, the topic is, of course, gender and all the stuff that's going on right now in the zeitgeist. But I yes. think I think um, for those for those of us who don't know you as well as they should, um, and also just for some relevant context, I think it'd be great if we just got a little bit about you, your background, where you're coming from with this whole thing. Sure. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist for many years, uh, more than 40. Uh, I've done a lot of different things in my career, including being a professor and academic administrator, an executive in the healthcare field, uh, consultant. Uh, I'm kind of best known in the last year or so as someone who is uh, quite knowledgeable about uh, gender issues, particularly with uh, gender questioning and transgender youth and families, uh, partly because of my work at UCSF, where I was a, a psychologist in the Child and Adolescent Gender Center, one of the leading such centers in the world, uh, and uh, was in leadership with WPATH and USPATH, most recently on the board of WPATH and, and uh, president of, of USPATH. So from those positions and with the other experience that I've had, uh, people have been very uh, interested to know what my observations have been about things happening with youth, uh, youth mental health, uh, youth uh, uh, gender exploration, and, and uh, the uh, practices that we have in terms of supporting youth who are questioning their gender. Mm. And so WPATH and USPATH, that's uh, the U.S. Professional Association for Transgender Health. Correct. And the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, tell us a little bit about those. What, what, are, what are the purposes of those organizations? What's their mission? Sure. So uh, WPATH uh, has been around for about 30 years. It uh, was founded by uh, an epidemiologist. or an endocrinologist named Harry Benjamin, and it was called the Harry Benjamin Gender Dysphoria Association before it was mm -hmm. dubbed WPATH. But for the last 30 years or so has really been the world's leading organization focused around researching the needs of transgender people, uh, developing guidelines for work and supporting transgender people, particularly in terms of health care, and in some ways advocacy for the needs of transgender people worldwide. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's uh, considered by virtually all sources as the authoritative um, source for standards of care for transgender people and currently uh, about to release any day now the standards of care 8, 8th edition, uh, which is the first edition, newest edition since the last edition, uh, SOC 7, which was released in 2012. So as everyone who, who's been paying attention to the world of gender issues knows, a lot has happened in the last 10 years. And so right. there's been a lot of interest in these standards and 
what the standards say and how uh, the adoption of these standards will affect the care that transgender people receive. Mm. Yeah, and I, um, I think... I think of particular interest, especially more recently, is how this pertains to minors or children, I guess, and yes. the, the complexities that arise there. Um, That's the key word, <laughs> the complexities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to you in particular is because you seem to engage in that complexity in a way that I find incredibly refreshing. Yeah, um, thank you and and important but that has garnered you quite a lot of heat um, because it's it's a difficult line to walk and it's a difficult perspective Mm -hmm. to maintain when things are so hot and contentious um and you know i love the the i love the line you have in your twitter bio just everyone deserves to be treated with respect and i think you you embody that in the way you're attempting to to talk about this stuff. Well, Maybe some you. people would, <laughs> some thank people might you. disagree depending on, you know, the opinion you land on, but, mm-hmm. but I, I certainly see it and I appreciate it. Um, but, well, you know. that's really great, Angel. Thank you. I, uh, that means a lot to me because that's really what I'm, what I'm, uh, seeking to do, which is provide light, uh, not heat, yeah. uh, and, uh, clar- <laughs> clar- like clarity, you know, not confusion, uh, so yeah, and 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 I I know that Fair is devoted to that too, uh, yes. and to um, you know eliminating intolerance and prejudice, mm-hmm. and I, I've been doing that for a long time. I consider myself a human human rights activist, and I've done that work in Europe, South America, as well as the United States. Yeah, it's 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 funny because you know it's so easy for people to just become one thing and be known for one thing and, and for people to actively resist breaking out of that one thing, mm-hmm. you know, but it, it's a shame because there's so much more to us, of course, and there's so much more to you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> <think> the, so. <laughs> the circumstances, the circumstances pull us into this, this one thing yeah. where we're, everything's going haywire, but you know, we're dancing around the topic. So, you know, why don't you tell us how you see the current climate? Uh, what what is it that's going haywire in your opinion? Right. So I think, uh, unfortunately, the strident voices of the extremes have uh, captured much of the attention uh, in the in the in society. And the extremes I would characterize, on the one hand, as people on the reactionary right who want to uh, eliminate uh, all care for transgender youth, uh, believing that you know. Kids can't possibly know who they are until they're older, and and that um, that the the consequences of of providing care are are uh, uncertain. Um, that's the most charitable way to characterize that view. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I've been a, a a vigorous opponent of legislation to eliminate or re- or reduce the freedom to provide care to trans youth. Uh, vigorous, uh, strenuous. And have in every at every turn said that I think that legislatures should not be determining for kids and families what is best for them. They should be doing that in concert with their doctors and other trusted advisors. And and that's that's been uh, my position for for a long, long time. Um, that's that's one side of it. Uh, and and uh, and there's more subtlety there, but just that's my kind of point of view sure. of, uh, about the far right. On the far left, my concern has been, and this is where I've gotten maybe uh, attacked by some who uh, misunderstand what I'm saying. Um, on the far left, there are people who I think, uh, I'm, I'm actually starting to call ideologues, people who are ideologically driven and who are not willing to have a conversation about the nuance and the subtlety. And they want to say that any anything that is less than full-throated uh, complete acceptance of everything trans, everybody who claims that they're trans or asserts that they're trans, and everything that they say they want, anything short of that is is transphobic, or is somehow uh, prejudiced, or mm. or is is uh, a disservice to trans people. 
I think I would be happy to put my track record uh, up against anyone else who criticizes me in that way and, and ask, what of my work would you criticize as being transphobic or not supporting trans people? Um, and so um, that's the dialogue I have that, um, that uh, I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about both of these extremes as I characterize them. And that's right. where I think my uh, willingness to, to talk with you uh, given your mission uh, of of tolerance, of dialogue, of fairness, uh, is so important because uh, I have people who uh, mischaracterize my position. I'm I'm trans affirmative, uh, happy pride. <laughs> you know, uh, I am yeah. transgender myself. I don't think that's come in yet, um, and so I know the struggle. I know the trauma that trans people have experienced. I have some myself. Uh, I, uh, but I'm a psychologist, so I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I am, I'm not most objective about myself, my own experience, uh, and that therefore I should have some, some, uh, reservations or some, some, uh, caution when I, when I presume that my experience, uh, reveals important things about other people. So I, I am, I am cautious, uh, uh. I, I sometimes say there's there's two it's people are sometimes too quick to overgeneralize and say, you know, well, trans people this, trans people that. And, you know, I mean, trans people are of many versions, uh, many ages and all kinds of other characteristics. And so I often say when when you've seen one transgender person. You've seen one transgender person, you know, right. don't overgeneralize. It's like overgeneralizing about any other characteristic, tall people, about race, about right. people who are differently abled, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender minority or sexual minorities. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm against prejudice. <laughs> what can right. I say? I'm, a, I'm, I'm for, <laughs> I'm for truth, you know, yeah. in, in, including individual truth. You know, I want everybody to feel loved and accepted. Uh, I want everybody to live their most authentic life, and sometimes uh, people struggle how to how to do that. I am uh, I'm given a great gift in my profession by traveling alongside a lot of people who are struggling struggling that way, and it's my privilege to try to help them be who they who they are authentically. Yeah, and I I have said a previous version of my website I had a little page. And that I, I, uh, I, which I titled permission to be, uh, I sometimes mm -hmm. invoke it cause I really love what I said there, which was, I don't have any assumptions about who you are. I, I want to help you be you. And, you know, it doesn't mean I, I'm going to push you one way or another. I'm, I'm, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to facilitate you discovering the truth about yourself. Yeah. Uh, so much of that probably uh, pretty much all of it resonates with me. I think, you know, it's, it's, and with fair as well. I mean, we are so much about, um, seeing people as unique individuals and kind of doing the, the sort of double work of recognizing every single human being's unique individuality, but also emphasizing our common humanity and kind of yes. working at those two ends covers everyone and everything in a beautiful way. Yeah. Uh, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I, um, you know, having been a professor, I lectured a lot, taught classes, including on sexuality. Um, I used to do a seminar on gender, sexuality, gender, and identity. And I kind of weave together, uh, some content about human sexuality, uh, mm. some about gender and some about, um, about, about trauma and society. And, um, I, it's, I, I've thought about this a long, long time, a long career as a psychologist. I think individual differences are the raison d'etre of psychology itself. You mm -hmm. know, how we're different one to another. And yet, as you say, Angel, we're, we share a common humanity and it's that humanity that creates the possibility of connection of, uh, of, uh, of peace of uh of restoration of repair of of ruptures uh you know uh i i i like to also invoke uh 
what happened in South Africa after apartheid was was overturned, um, the truth and reconciliation movement. And I think we we need that. That's 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 not a once and done. I think humanity needs truth and reconciliation as a steady diet of how we how we live, mm. how we how yeah. we engage each other. Yeah. You're in a you're in a similar position, or I guess an analogous position is a better way to say, as many people that I talk to, and and even to some extent myself. You know, with respect to the concept of race, I'm, you know, I'm a I'm <laughs> I'm Latin X supposedly. Uh, mm-hmm. I hate that term, but mm-hmm. um, that puts me in a strange spot because uh, it's Hispanic or. Spanish-speaking people are not considered a, a specific race. There can be people from that same cohort that are split up into different supposed races. You know, there mm-hmm. could be Black Hispanics and White Hispanics, and that makes me what I call a daywalker, which is hmm. you know, I, I, it's like a vampire who can walk around in the daytime, oh, right? Okay, and and it allows me to see both worlds, mm-hmm. right? And then that gives me a certain perspective, and you know, someone. Someone else, like someone like Thomas Chatterton Williams, who is, you know, half, half, you know, quote unquote black, half, quote unquote white, allows him to see things that maybe others couldn't because they have a different experience. So you have a similar position because you are a transgender woman Mm -hmm. uh, and you have that experience and you have that sort of focal point from which to see the world, but you're also a psychologist. And so you can, you can put those two points of view in conflict with one another. Uh, I'm curious to hear if you, if you can recall any particular moments of tension where you had to resolve something like that within yourself before we get to the larger sort of societal context. I I, I would say it's an ongoing process, um, Mm -hmm. uh, with that in that, um, my human sexuality textbook when I was in university many years ago, uh, said, didn't even have transgender in the in the book mm. or the index, the closest thing that it had um, to what we would recognize as transgender was transsexual. And uh-huh. uh, what it said about those who were transsexual, which by the way, was discussed in the section on transvestism in the, in the chapter on, on, on fetishes. So uh-huh. um, what it said about, uh, about I'll say us, was that we have a deep-seated psychiatric disorder, and that some of some of some transsexuals can be helped by access to hormones and surgery to live in the opposite gender, um, mm-hmm. depicting male and female as opposite, which I think most people no longer accept as a as a the most uh, accurate way to understand male and female. But so that was mm-hmm. where I started. You know, I was, I was uh, what I, I thought at the time I was a, a straight, um, uh, cisgender male. Um, and yet I had things going on in, in, inside of me that I, that I couldn't quite understand. And I was a young psychologist. So there, there was a struggle that my struggle began that way by, by trying to understand, well, what do I really have that, whatever that condition is? Um, do, am I transsexual? Am I, am I, do I have a fetish? What, what, you know, so the literature was not helpful to me, Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in that time. And so I began almost instinctively to come to to terms with who I was. And I thought to myself, then I, I don't, I don't think I have a deep seated psychiatric disorder. There were no other symptoms of psychiatric disorder that I could Mm -hmm. point to and say, well, see, I'm, you know, transsexual psych. So I, I, I had in effect a personal study going on for many years with myself. Like, what does this right. mean? What do these thoughts and feelings uh, say to me about who I am? And and then of course the field started to move away from the very obvious uh, pathologizing of trans identities to a to a more humane perspective, and that's taken decades. But now we have, uh, just to fast forward, we have in the International Classification of Diseases, uh, transgender uh, uh, in the 11th edition of ICD, not, uh, ICD was t- is taken out of psychiatry 
and and put in sexual health and the the language about it is that people who are gender minorities or transgender uh are uh represent an, an, a normal variation uh which accounts for the history of gender minorities which is uh uh is present for anybody to to review and that is throughout human civilization we've had examples of people who were we'd call today transgender or some other gender than strictly male or female and in many native cultures um such persons were revered as shaman uh, as spiritual leaders and and people to be admired and and respected and yet in um eurocentric cultures um that's not been the case that that um that you know we have a you know half millennia of colonial uh domination of peoples uh that that were different than than the european uh peoples who who colonized them and i think there was a there was a sort of forced indoctrination about sex and gender and it's had very deleterious effects uh hmm. historically and uh you know so we we had in in american culture to bring it even closer to current time we had the emergence of uh not only sort of enforced uh regulations about who people needed to be and how they needed to behave and how they needed to be with each other you know uh racial intermarriage was only uh ruled legal in in my lifetime you know and uh and gay marriage even more recently yeah. so right. so th- there was a there was an imposition of uh values which were clearly not scientifically informed or or universal but particular values based in beliefs uh imposed on others and that and that regrettably continues in America where mm-hmm. there are people who believe that they can enforce upon others their values and you know witness the debate about uh women's women's choice choices about their bodies and and reproductive right. rights and you know uh yeah. some would throw us back into an era when a certain group in society dictated to everyone else what they should do how they should behave and what is acceptable and not I mean it's only been a, a few years since some of the sodomy laws were taken off the books in uh in in states in the United States and uh you know we had we had a celebrated scientist in Britain who uh broke the code the Nazi uh code who uh who yeah. who then Alan was Turing. yeah was was disgraced rather than yeah. celebrated I mean more recently celebrated but you know rather than celebrated as one of the many people who contributed to the war effort and the defeat of the nazis was humiliated for being yeah. a homosexual uh as yeah. though that had anything to do with his work uh, as a as a brilliant uh code breaker i mean yeah. <laughs> so we have many examples right. of people who whose private uh sexuality or gender uh has been pounced on uh and uh mm-hmm. where people have been um made to feel less than and it's not yeah. just gender of course as we know but um so it's it's a very complicated subject um and I and agree. Uh, yeah it, yeah and and I I I just I mean the level of ignorance continues to surprise me um uh, you know we had a, a congress person last year who who uh in response to uh another congress person putting up a trans flag outside their office put a big poster you know who I'm talking about uh said mm-hmm. um there are you have to get it there's only two genders male and female you know mm. uh read the science as as though yeah. she in fact read the science she clearly has not um uh, cuz we've always had variations including intersex people uh who yeah. are so- you know yeah i i definitely want to ask you about that because i feel i feel that a lot of this confusion or a lot of the crosstalk and a lot of the difficulty comes from defining terms differently seeing terms 
understanding them differently mm-hmm. and sort of not realizing that you're you're hitting each other with the same word but meaning different things or slightly different things or maybe more complicated things so what is sex and what is gender as as according to you at the very least yeah i think most people would think that sex is grounded a little bit more in biology uh, mm-hmm. and uh and gender has as uh, is more of a, a, a social and personal phenomenological uh, aspect. Uh, and I, I do differentiate between the two, although they're not completely uh, independent, or right. as, this, as the mathematicians say, orthogonal. You know, they're not, com- <laughs> they, 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 they yeah. do relate to each other. But sex, sex is something that we observe um, in, in terms of characteristics that, um, you know, we can define. So, you know, sex historically has been uh, judged at birth. Uh, in the, even the last few decades, we've come to start to define the sex of a baby in utero uh, mm-hmm. through using a sonogram. Uh, most pregnant women in the United States, at least, are afforded a sonogram in the, in the second or third trimester. Usually the second is the first one. And by then, the physical parts of a baby are apparent in, on the sonogram. And the interesting thing about that is that the only thing that is used to define the sex of the baby is the presence or absence of an appendage, which we call a penis. Uh, mm. And so that's, that's, you know, and it's through, a, it's, if you've ever seen an a image of a sonogram, it's kind of fuzzy, you know? I mean, <laughs> you, if you know what you're doing, yeah. you can kind of make out what they are, but... Um, so we, we, you know, we define baby's sex at birth, but what we know is that, uh, that in the zygote, the fertilized egg and, and sperm in, in utero, is all the mm. biological material necessary to develop what we historically consider a male body or a female body. In fact, female body is the default body for a human. Um, uh-huh. and, and so, you know, uh, the differentiation occurs very early, uh, first trimester. Um, mm-hmm. but by the time the, the baby is more fully developed as a fetus, um, you know, we're, we're determining sex, but there are dozens of, of differences, um, in terms of chromosomes and, um, uh, and, uh, theoretically an infinite number of variations in terms of body parts that can be differences from stereotypical male or stereotypical female bodies hmm. and, and, and chromosomes. So, you know, these, these differences, uh, when, when observed at birth, and they're not always observed at birth, we, we rarely do a genetic testing of a baby at birth. Right. Uh, that, would, that would reveal potentially chromosomal differences, but, but, but obvious physical differences in terms of genitalia, for example, are right. are apparent at birth, and that's the basis for determining sex. Even though now the the data say that as many as one hundred in six hundred live births in the United States constitute one of a number of what what are called intersex conditions. So uh-huh. these can be situations where there's anomalous body parts, where there's some uh, uh, chemical or chromosomal variation, and so forth. And yeah. It, it, it's a, it's a, that's a whole nuanced subject because it, due to advances in prenatal care and, and, and birthing and, and postnatal care, babies that may have been intersex in the past who had challenges, what, for whatever reason, physical, may not have survived mm-hmm. childbirth and, or, or early um, infancy. And so uh, arguably we're going to have more <laughs> intersex, uh, interesting. intersex conditions. Uh, people with intersex conditions. And there's a controversy in the UK now uh, led by activists uh, on behalf of intersex people that, um, that challenges the historic approach to intersex babies, which, is, which has been hush, hush, quiet, quiet, do a surgery to make the genitalia conform to uh, what people think is male or female. I have a niece who has who who, who was born with two uteri, oh, and wow. and she didn't know until she was examined in adulthood 
as a part of her OBGYN care because she was thinking about having a baby. Now you're yeah. saying, you said one in 100 and 600? One in 600. Are or one in 600. One in 600, live births. Live, live births. births. That doesn't count, you know, right. miscarriages and, and so mm-hmm. on. But um, so, so I, I'm not, a, I'm not a biologist, so it's, it's difficult for me to, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I couldn't challenge you if I, if I, if I wanted to necessarily <laughs> on yeah. this stuff. I'm, you know, that's not my uh, expertise, but I, I hear you saying, or I hear you sort of insinuating that, that assigning sex at birth is not, it's not as accurate a, a an, an action as we believe, or or we shouldn't do it, or how is it that you well, feel about no, that? Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be uh, obtuse here. So I think oh, no, we it's still, just me thinking, thinking no, through. I, I think we're going to s- still assign uh, sex at birth. Okay. But I, yeah, I'm just, yeah. I'm just pointing out that people look to biological sex as the, the mm-hmm. foundation for figuring everything out about sex and gender. And I'm saying even there, wow. there's some slippage. It's not exactly, you know, binary, you know, male and female, uh, that there, there, uh-huh. there are some variations. And, and actually even a government document a few years ago, U.S. government document, uh, reviewing sort of meta review of all the research on sex and gender pointed out that uh, sexual and gender minority variation are normal variations in, in uh-huh. nature and that they've always been present. We just didn't, we just acted like they weren't present. We, you know, we did surgeries on babies. We didn't know about what was going to happen with chromosomal differences. We've discovered a lot, but Mm -hmm. people who, people who say, well, there are only two sexes. No. And that's the most biological characteristic. Then we have sexual orientation and we have gender Mm -hmm. identity and expression, which are are far more nuanced. Right. Right. Yeah. So, but what would you say to people who, you know, my understanding of sex is that, you know, uh, it is binary because there are only two potential uh, gametes that get produced. Uh, I may be screwing up the language here. Well, the but, gametes uh, are are um, sperm and egg. Right. And, ye- and yes, there's only sperm and egg. There's not a third, like, gamete right. that, you know, like, produces something else. But even... Even if you take those two and you say, okay, that's, that produces the zygote, the fertilized mm-hmm. egg and sperm is a zygote. That's the beginning of the combination, you know, the, the genesis of a, of a, of a baby. Mm-hmm. Even there, you have all these variations I was just discussing, which are, right. which are not apparent until birth most times. Okay. Right. But they can be detected. Some of them can be detected in utero. Some of the genetic things can be yeah. detected in utero. So I can, okay. Yeah. So I can see that being, you know, a uh, reason to, again, as we mentioned earlier, to emphasize the individual and to, you know, point to that. And, and when it comes to care, it should be individualized care. Right. Uh, That's right. But, but, but it doesn't necessarily refute the idea that sex is largely binary and that, you know, for the most yeah. part, we will we will hit the target when we right <laughs> when that's we right. sex at birth right okay. that's right so and the, the other the other element though that's important angel is is time so you know we have uh-huh. a, a nine months in utero but then you have the growing uh, child and over time uh, children express differences all kinds of differences and uh, we know from some of the research on child development that some temperamental differences can be detected even in utero, you uh-huh. know, believe it or not, you know, a more active or passive baby and so on. Yeah. And, and we know that the brain is developing even though the baby's not born yet. So, mm-hmm. you know, there are studies on uh, psycholinguistic studies that, that, that look at, well, the, the, the ones that are most impressive are the ones with uh, by, by, mm, uh, bilingual, bicultural mothers and and what happens with their babies and and they've done brain studies with with fetuses mm-hmm. where they they can show that a fetus understands the difference between when the mother is talking in one language versus when the mother is using the uh, the different language wow. and and the reactions of the brain in utero 
map to the reactions of the brain after the baby is born. So wow. th- there's, there's an ability of the child to register mother's voice and a language yeah. difference, which is like, wow. isn't that kind of mind boggling? So yeah, that's a, the, wow. the, the brain's <laughs> turned on, you know, from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But of course, the rapid period of development of the brain is the second trimester. So that's mm-hmm. a time when, you know, uh, in neural pathways proliferate, you know, the, the brain is really starting to mature and, and so on. By the third trimester, the brain is working. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, we, we start absorbing messages, uh, <laughs> certainly when we're babies, but even yeah. in utero. And if you think about it, so mothers, and, and the, the, there's another set of studies that show that mothers speak to their babies differently if they think the baby is a male baby or a female baby. Hmm. So we, we socialize our children before they're born. Hmm. You know, there was a period, I think they've fallen out of favor for good reason, but uh, of, of so-called gender reveal parties. Yeah. You, you've heard of them. Well, you know, yeah. Where- they fell out of favor because people started exploding and dying. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. They, yeah, exactly. And they set fire to things. I, I think yeah, it's one crazy. Was, they had fireworks and they went off into the you know the brush and started a wildfire. And I mean, yeah, yeah, in Los Angeles, yeah, yeah. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. It's like <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> and uh, I'm I'm an interesting uh, person to talk about this because I have two grown children who are my biological children and their father, and. Mm. Uh, and I was married to their mother, uh, biological mother, uh, for many years. And uh, I remember when she was pregnant, and uh, there was a question, and this isn't that long ago, there was a question, you know, well, sonogram or not? And, right. and the decision in the case of both pregnancies was, mother is healthy. We don't yet know what the long-term effects of sonogram are. So we're um, not going to do it. Okay. So we were surprised when they were born, you know, like one was a girl and one was a boy and so on. But, uh, but, but now people want to know, like, you know, I want to know. And, and in fact, when they do a sonogram for a woman who's pregnant, 95% of mothers want to know the sex of the baby, meaning penis or no penis, you know? Right. Right. So this is months before the baby is going to be born. And they're already then gendering that child, and 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 extended family are too. Mm. Okay, so we're we're. I noticed we've we've done the thing, and I do it all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I this is so this is a, another reason I wanted to ask you this is because you know growing up, the word sex and the word gender were sort of used interchangeably in in everyday speak, right? Not not in not in biology class or science class or or anything like that. Yes. And certainly not at the doctor, but gender was kind of seen as a euphemistic way of saying sex um, yes. because sex seemed a little bit too risque of a thing to say, which is also silly, but, <laughs> but there yeah. is a distinction. And I'm curious, mm-hmm. what is gender as, as far so as I, 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 I consider gender to be the felt identity of a person insofar mm-hmm. as whether they are male or female or non-binary or some variation. And, um, and, you know, how can that be disparate from sex? Well, we don't entirely know this is the truth. We, we don't really know. There probably are a multiplicity of factors. But uh, people whose gender doesn't align with their sex as assigned at birth have been around throughout human history. You know, we yeah. know this. I was saying this earlier. So, right. so what and, are some prominent and, examples of that, actually? Because I'm very curious to hear more. Um, so, well, um, in in native peoples in the in North America, there's something called two spirit. Um, oh, yeah. And, and these are these are people who who seem to exude some of the aspects of males and females. Um, that's uh-huh. why they call them two two spirit. Um, uh-huh. And and that's a that's an ancient, as far as we can tell, uh, uh, experience in those gotcha. people. Haraji. Is a is a group in uh, in South Asia uh, who are um, what most people would consider trans females. They they uh, they are identified when when they're young, uh, you know, in a stereotype way. We might consider them 
effeminate males, uh, but then they're they're raised in this in this tradition, and they grow up to to assume many of the roles of of adult females, uh, childcare, mm-hmm. uh, home homemaking, uh, cooking. Some of them live in communities with each other, and some live uh, with their families and so forth. Um, yeah. There's there's another tradition in uh, in Brazil. Uh, there in Portuguese they're called uh, transvesti, um, mm. which is you know kind of a r- rough translation of in English transsex- transsexual or or transvestite, some mix yeah. of those. And these are these are people largely who are uh, uh, biological males who have this feminine aspect, and they and they find themselves in communities. I've been with mm. them in Brazil. It's really quite quite fascinating. Um, they consider themselves women, uh, and, uh, and operate in society as, as women. They're not transvestites in the way that we think of maybe in, in USA, people who are men whose identity is male, but they dress up as women sometimes. No, they're, they're people who consider themselves women, but they, Mm. but they, in most cases don't take hormones or have surgeries. Uh, that's changing a little bit because now there, these me- these medical approaches are available in Brazil in a way that they weren't until maybe the last 20, 25 years or so. Mm. So, so what, these what are- would you say? Well, what would you say if uh, you know? I'm hearing a lot of this stuff, and I'm trying to think through the the kind of perspective of other people and what they might say or how they might receive it. And I'm you know one thing is it sounds it sounds like it might be a kind of gender essentialism or a kind of, you know, this is, these are, and this is something that we hear a lot these days where it's, you know, if you are a, if you are assigned female at birth, but you are very much into sports, you might actually be trans, right? As opposed to the, the logic that I grew up understanding, you know, the, the, the progressivism of my upbringing the progressivism was you don't have to be a boy to like sports. You don't have to be a boy to mm-hmm. like trucks or, or construction or things right. like that. There's no, there's nothing inherently masculine about those things. And there's nothing inherently feminine about, you know, loving poetry or, or crying, you know, mm-hmm. when you watch a movie or something like that. And, you know, yeah. as an artist as well, you know, I've, I've, I've been a kind of day walker in that sense as well, you know, as, I love poetry. I cry in movies. Music makes me cry. Uh, mm-hmm. And there was that machismo nonsense that I had to kind of deal with mm-hmm. where, oh, I'm not, I'm not as much of a man and all this crazy stuff, right? Yeah. But I, I see a lot of that happening and it seems like, are we veering into essentializing? Are we veering into or, or regressing back to that sort of thing in the way we talk I, about I this stuff? I think that's a very astute question, Angel. And I have actually written about this. Um, okay. saying that I think there is a resurgence of gender policing, despite the widespread recognition that maybe we have a, a spectrum of gender. And so mm-hmm. this policing is of a type to sort of say that, you know, unless you're a masculine man or a feminine woman, maybe you should question your gender. And mm-hmm. uh, I think that's fundamentally wrong. You know, we used to have other People, colleagues I know have written about this, that we used to have tomboys uh, right. in, in America. Where did, the tom, where did the tomboys go? You know, uh, mm-hmm. and some, some critics have said they're being encouraged to become boys. You know, that they're, right. they're, they're saying, I'm a, I'm a boy, I'm trans. And, uh, and I think there's some reason to seriously consider whether that's true. Um, there is, there's another critique uh, going on that that from the lesbian community that says, you know, why is it that so many butch les what we used to call butch lesbians right. are saying that they're trans trans males, and and I think what this does belie is exactly what you're asking about, which is a narrowing of gender roles back from what it had kind of, I mean, if you think back thirty years, you know, we had David Bowie and J- Boyd George and you know, yeah. Katy Perry, uh, not Katy Perry, Katy Lang. And, you know, we have lots of, of uh, uh, people, certainly in the entertainment world, who've mm-hmm. been gender bending and, right. and sort of challenging 
And, and there's always been, uh, well, I shouldn't say it that way. I think there's always been some level of androgyny in, in many societies, people who haven't felt obliged to be narrowly, right. narrowly uh, fixed in a stereotype. I, I, I welcome that reopening again. You know, I, 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 I and I, I have been saying for a long time, I think we, we've, we've equated, um, you know, uh, male, male sex assignment with male gender, with straight male, mm -hmm. uh, masculine male. And right. as though, as though these are in lockstep, and they're not, you know, that, right. that people can place themselves. And I think we used to also think of, not only we used to think of sex, you know, male and female as opposites, we used to think of feminine and masculine as opposites. And I think that's completely wrong. I think there are two ah. continua, masculine and feminine, and any individual might place themselves on highly or less masculine or highly or less feminine. And that can change. You know, right. we can, we can sort of change our, expression of who we are. And I think a healthy society allows individuality, allows uh, a wide range of expression. And, you know, like if we're not hurting anybody else, who cares? You know, right. why, why is it so important that, yeah, that all men do this? And, you know, I, I often yeah. joke, joke, I say, you know, people have bought into this, these very kind of rigid stereotypes, like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. <laughs> I don't think so. You know, we're not completely different. In fact, the the vast literature on quote gender differences can be distilled down to a very small number of characteristics where there might be some differences, okay? Mm. But that and there's a there's a, an important meta review in the American Psychologist a few years ago where it said uh it it reviewed hundreds of studies with hundreds of thousands of subjects to try to understand what's what's male and what's female and these are youth okay mm -hmm. uh you know children and, and adolescents and what they yeah. came up with was four or five characteristics where there was a st statistically significant difference in a large population study but the statistically significant difference was very small because if you know statistics you know the larger number you get, the less you have to have a difference to have it be statistically significant. And to show mm. you the, the meaning of this, so, and I'm sorry, this is a little technical, but, you know, we all know the bell-shaped curve, you know, there, right. any trait can be depicted in a bell-shaped curve and average is in the middle and then the extremes are on the out, out, outside. So around the middle, two thirds of a population are going to be clustered, you know, in the, right. in the bell. Yeah. The, one standard deviation is a third of the population, 33%. And if you, if you look at this meta review, which I encourage uh, listeners to, to do, American Psychologist 2015, um, that uh, the, <laughs> the level of uh, difference was 0.3, I'm sorry, 0.1 of a standard deviation so it's a tenth of a standard deviation, which is 33%. So 3% oh, wow. difference yeah. between boys and girls constitute a statistically significant difference. Well, you have 100%. Uh, there's, so there's much more difference within each sex or gender right. than, than across the, the sexes. So yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. And I, again, I, this is why I keep coming back to the, the thing that I think we're miscommunicating a lot of the time about because we're using terms differently. So, you know, for example, gender you defined as uh, one's identification, right? Yeah. And and that to me I would have used I would have used the term with the qualifier gender identity, right? Mm -hmm. In order for me to be clear, especially because of my sort of um you know, the habit and the upbringing of of using sex and gender fairly interchangeably, I would yeah. have said, oh, you mean gender identity. That's what you're talking about. How, how uh, yeah. you perceive yourself and conceive of yourself based upon sort of, you know, norms mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, sort of, yeah, I guess norms and, and just the commonalities based that, you know, usually you can kind of put traits along a spectrum. You can say, generally speaking, that men prefer using 
using their hands and doing things with their hands and women prefer doing things another way, you know, all that sort of psychological literature. Uh, but but yeah. the way that you yourself are as an individual, the way you feel and the way you feel like expressing all those things, that's a different thing. And that becomes incredibly unique and, spec- and specified. Yes. And um, you're right that I do mean gender identity because of then, of course, as you know, we have also what we call gender expression, which yeah. uh, is, is, you know, you could express yeah, kind of your outward facing Right, right. You could express gender. your gender in a more androgynous way than you actually feel. You might feel very male or very female, but kind of right. appear to others to be like so, sort of a mixture. Um, yeah. And that and that mixture and that that in between has has to some extent been tolerated in most cultures. You know, right. the, the you know they might think of that's the you know that's the masculine girl or that's the feminine boy or whatever. It, another another important factor. Uh, that I, I'm concerned about is, and it's, it's hasn't, it isn't new, and I'm not unique in talking about it. But this uh, compulsion, I'll call it, to uh, police gender means that kids who are maybe emerging in their sexual identity as as gay, gay or lesbian, right. uh, might might be sort of channeled into questioning their gender. Uh, rather than allowing their attractions and their feelings about others to to emerge um, yeah. uncomplicated, so you know, are we are we um, are we basically failing a whole group of future gay people by right. telling them that it's really not about sex; it's about gender. It's really yeah. not about sexual orientation; it's about gender. And and I think yeah. that's a big and open question. Yeah, so we've arrived at the the, the really nuclear stuff here, uh, <laughs> which <laughs> which is you know the the children and the concern with the children. And I think I should you know, my view is that everyone who's so animated about this, nearly everyone, is not operating from a place of cynicism or or uh, malice. I really do think that the vast majority of people who are super, super animated about this on either side of things are are motivated by a sincere concern and a sincere desire to do right by mm-hmm. the people that they care about and children mm-hmm. being, you know, obviously chief amongst those. And I yeah. think the stakes are incredibly high. So, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> so that that's the difficulty here. Um, but where do you stand on this thing? Because there are, you know, there is a, I don't know. It's uh, another problem is just trying to figure out whether whether the 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 numbers going up in terms of cases that we hear about and things like that. If if that's just a a, a function of our social media landscape and the way that you know any little thing can be communicated and blown up, how prevalent is this? It's hard to know exactly, but but it is it is safe to say that this has become a much more prominent topic. Yes. Um, especially yeah. you know, transgender youth, transgender children. This has become yes. a very prominent topic. And and uh, and there's there are few subjects in society that can bring out more emotion than talking about children. I mean witness the witness the outpouring of of uh, feelings about Uvalde and the school shooting. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know we we love our children. You know, and we love other people's children. We love children. We want them to be healthy and happy and and uh, uh, and uh, and accepted. I I wrote the the chapter on gender development for a textbook on the gender affirmative model a few years ago, and mm-hmm. and so I've I've been on record and in fa- in in practice uh, an uh, an advocate of affirming children and accepting what children tell us. But uh, listening carefully to children and affirming them doesn't mean we give them everything that they want, you know. So well, okay. So when you say affirming, mm-hmm. what do you mean by that? I, I mean, I mean, saying to a child, "I want to hear what you have to say to me. I'm mm-hmm. li- going to listen, and I'm going to um, make sure I understand what it means to you, and 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 use it to to try to help you be you." And and maybe that means that the, that their gender is different than sex assigned at birth, and maybe it's just that they're gender questioning, 
And that's mm-hmm. a subtlety that I think is lost in some of the dialogue right now, which is, you know, um, uh, being gender affirming doesn't mean you think every child who has questions about gender is transgender. Um, in fact, I, I would say there's, there's uh, some reason to believe that this recent upsurge in kids who are asserting a gender different than sex assigned at birth is, is not well understood that we have a confluence of a number of factors. Some, some people would say, oh, this is all for the good because, uh, of course, we've created a more accepting society in which children are, are feeling free to express themselves, be themselves, and tell other people. I think right. that's one element, and I have celebrated that, and I've worked right. for that actively as, yeah. a, as an activist. But the numbers are, are, are difficult to reconcile with what we've known historically. If you've seen the recent um, CDC numbers, Pew, Pew Research Foundation, and last year's Gallup poll, which show that with each succeedingly younger generation, a larger and larger proportion of young people assert a sexual or gender minority label. And now it's up to current cohort of, of adolescents, as many as 20%, mm-hmm. which is probably 10 times uh, another generation or, or so. So I have a public health background, uh, and you, you, you used a, a public health word, prevalence. So what is the actual prevalence of gender and sexual minorities in a, in a large population? And, you know, I think there's an open question about that, about what is mm-hmm. the actual prevalence. And, um, and since we have all kinds of, of issues in the science of epidemiology about how we count things, how we define them and how we count them, and then monitoring whether there's a, a changing uh, proportion in the population prevalence. And then the other word in public health that's relevant is incidence. That's the number of new cases in any period of time, you know, in a year, whatever. So we have in this current time, a larger proportion of kids saying that they're this label or or that label. And we have um, some other factors, which I've been also speaking about, I think, as you know, Angel, and that is um, we've had a massive uh, I'm going to call it a social experiment. What does it do to a generation of adolescents if you if you take away the school experience, live in person school experience, and all that that entails? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, provide education through the internet through Zoom school, and 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 uh, and what happens on the other end of that? Well, we know that social experience for teenagers is a huge part of their lives. Right. Because yeah. because they're they're maturing, they're developing in all the ways that they do. But certainly they're developing in terms of their social, emotional intelligence and their peer relations. And, and then that informs their identity formation. So we have always think thought of adolescence as a time when one of the developmental milestones is formation of identity. Well, uh, actually, formation of identity occurs across a lifetime, but it's more obvious during teenage years. You know, you figure sure. out who you are. So, yeah, who I people, remember that. Who your people are. Yeah, most of us do. <laughs> I remember some that. Us, it, was, it was incredibly some, unpleasant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think most people say something like that. Like, it wasn't all that great. Um, yeah. So, so a lot of teenagers feel awkward about many aspects, their bodies, you know, social yeah. relationships and so on. So, what has happened as a compensation, not intentional, but is that because we have the internet and social media, kids have consumed many, many more hours per week of social media than ever before. No mm-hmm. generation that's existed on the planet has, has been exposed to this much social media. And we don't really know what the effects are. There have been hearings in Congress about the effects, so some people are concerned about it. And, right. and the, the tech companies have been grilled about their algorithms, and they have admitted publicly that their algorithms essentially drive clicks and, and, and minutes of, of viewing. So, right. you know, and that there's, a, there, there are some weird financial incentives for how that mm-hmm. traffic occurs because people have a financial incentive yeah. to, to yeah. do it. So, so what happens when you have largely unmonitored use of the internet by an impressionable population who are trying to figure out who they are. Right. And that's, so, yeah. that's where we find ourselves. 
So you're and talking about the social contagion hypothesis. I, yeah, I, I try to not use that word. But right. I have said very publicly and very strongly, why would we think that um, gender, gender identity formation is the one area for teenagers that in which they are not influenced by their peers? Mm -hmm. I have no logical reason to think that they're not. Okay. Right. And I, I have lots of reasons to believe that they are influenced by their peers in that area, just like every other area. And, and we have, we have unfortunately evolved to the point where, uh, unlike previous generations that had uh, a sort of a complicated mixture of influences, uh, real and, and uh, technological, this generation has been uh, driven to have far more influence from technological uh, mm -hmm. influences. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of a, weird uh, depiction that occurs through all the visual images we're, we're inundated with. You know, we now have devices, all of us, that, um, you know, that it, it, at any given moment, we could be inundated with stuff that's fed to us, our feeds. Right. And, and that is, a lot of it is visual images. So, so kids are seeing visual images. Mm -hmm. And then there's some talking. But it's a lot of visual images, so they're unduly influenced by visual images. We know that young teenagers are are, are historically um, comparing themselves to others, and right. they're and and in some cases they really kind of develop some kind of idealized version of what you know a boy or a girl you know should be, should mm -hmm. look like you know. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do what what others have. You know, it's like the active shooter games in video games and the Kardashian mm -hmm. circus have told us this is what a boy <laughs> is and this is what ah. a girl is. And it's like, Oh my God, my head is going to explode. It's like, mm -hmm. where's the, where's the more nuanced complete version of what a person is. And right. you know, why, why, why are we spending so much time looking at these things and and having it um, influence us. So I think there so, is social influence. Um, I don't think anybody becomes trans by contagion per se. So right. that's where I might differ from some others. But I think some of my colleagues who have written about this, I think, are onto something. And yeah. and I give them some credit for saying, "Hey, wait a minute. You know, maybe we're letting our kids watch too much social media. Maybe we're um, we're not providing them." Uh, a, a balanced perspective about how to be yeah. who they are. That's certainly where I would put my flag down is on the sort of, there's no way to stop the, the flow, but there is a way to teach people to surf and, and kind of <laughs> like figure out, yeah. okay, this is how you navigate this because it's not going to stop and there's no. no way I can control it for you. There's no way you can control it. No. Um, you know, but no. yeah, to touch to touch on what you're talking about, it's not totally unreasonable for me to to see the potential for you know, a, I guess a kind of like exponential digital peer influence, right? Because that's mm -hmm. that's so much of my experience and so much of I think most people's experience growing up of trying to find your identity, as you were describing. You know, I I had a hard time. Because I couldn't fit into any of the boxes that were available. Mm -hmm. And so I struggled for a long time with feeling very much alienated in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't even fit it with the other people who were alienated. So like, the, you know, there were, there were like the, the yeah. <laughs> there was like that crew of people who were the outcasts, but even with them, I didn't quite fit. Right. So, right. so, but, but at that time, you know, it was such a struggle and it was so painful and it was such a, a, a difficult thing to deal with every day on top of everything else that if i had if i had the opportunity to fit well into some box i would have probably tr elected to do that because i attempted to and the mm -hmm. only reason that it didn't work is because i i literally just couldn't fake it right yeah. but if you can it's very easy to slip into that sort of stuff and then if if that sort of stuff gets you know affirmed for a lack of a better term it's easy for you to stay there, even if you don't necessarily belong there. Yeah, I, you know? I, I, I am. Yes. And I'm worried about um, 
uh, our uh, difficulty in helping uh, current young generation develop critical thinking skills. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, I, I used to teach a class on contemporary healthcare issues uh, years ago when I taught uh, healthcare management, and uh, I used to have a whole class on uh, health li health literacy. You know, to to try to um, address the issue of the fact that with um, with the internet requires a new level of understanding of how to find authoritative uh, vetted information. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you, I had so many discussions with doctors in those years who would say, you know, my patient came to me and told me what they had wrong with them and what treatment they wanted for it because they'd gone on the internet and diagnosed <laughs> themselves yeah. and, and so on. So there was a whole generation of physicians, uh, medical providers who, who started to adapt to um, this kind of give and take with patients uh, bringing not only signs and symptoms, but also other sources of things. So I think we, 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 need, to, we need to do a better job of, of finding out what's true. This is complicated by the confusing messages in the broader society, uh, right. you know, terms like alternative facts. <laughs> <laughs> I, to my way of thinking, there are not alternative facts. There are facts right. and, yes. to, and things that are not facts. And then we've also conflated um, uh, the the difference between know and believe. You know, mm -hmm. like the, the people who say things like, well, I don't believe in climate science. It's like, well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's there, you know, right. and, and as though that's that that's an option. You know, you can yeah. either believe in science or not believe in science. And then the last conflation that I experience with this current generation a lot is they say they, they're confusing what they want with what they need. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so, you know, I, I get kids saying, I need this, I need this. Uh, and, and when it, when you break it down, it's, they do want that. But whether they objectively need it or not is is another question. Sometimes I have yeah. to be a little bit more devious, I guess I'd say, yeah. to adults in trying to figure <laughs> that out because I, yeah. I do I do want them to get what they need, but but right. but the uh, uh, assumption I think on the part of some kids is you know if I tell you I need it I need it of end of discussion, yeah. you know, yeah. and I don't think that's always true in the way they they think it is. Yeah. So that, that brings us to, you know, the, the real issue of what do we do here? Because I, I, I think, I think we, we can both acknowledge that the concern is valid and real in many ways on either end of, of these discussions about, you know, trans children and, you know, what they're telling us versus what is real and, and whether, how much we should trust their perception of reality mm -hmm. um, or how much we should trust their ability to gauge where mm -hmm. they're actually at in terms of their development or their gender identity. Yeah. And there are, there are really difficult decisions that need to be made there, right? When, you know, there, and then there are very unhelpful arguments on either end yeah. of if you don't, if you don't affirm you are, you know, you are you're not just bigoted, but, but you're harming. You're yeah, causing harmful, harm. Yeah. Probably worse than that, right? <laughs> probably well, you're, you're, yeah, I, you're I, putting I, them really, on the path to murder, right? Earlier so. today, I had parents tell me that they were told that if they didn't affirm their child's uh, asserted gender, that they would put them on a path to suicide. Right, and, exactly, and, yeah. And that yeah. and that mantra has been out there and is being repeated. And I think it's, it's unhelpful uh, in, in, in the individual instance, probably wrong. Because right. that mantra doesn't explain the particulars of an individual child and their actual risk of self harm, mm -hmm. um, so we need to evaluate that. And I'm I'm the yeah. first one to say, you know, if someone is at risk. Let's by all means address it and keep kids safe. You know, I've a long career keeping kids safe. You know, yeah. uh, counseling parents. You know, if they're, if you're if that's what's going on with your child, you need to take them to the emergency room or. You know, right. you need to get them evaluated. So I'm, I'm definitely in favor of that. I think the, um, the histrionics about it are unhelpful. You right. know, that people who, who, who want, and, and people who want to say, well, you know, every, every trans kid this or every trans kid that. I have some, I've, I've called out some professionals who say, 
you know, that they, they operate in the following way that if a child tells you they're trans, they're trans, give them the hormones. Right. There's no yeah. area of medicine or psychology where we just assume that self-report is the be all end all explanation for something yeah. we do an evaluation. And that, right. And that, that, that goes to the concerns of people on the other end uh, of, you know, things that are quite permanent and could right. be incredibly harmful and damaging. Right. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to be concerned about. It um, is. But of course the, uh, the unhelpful rhetoric around it, you know, groomer, pedophilia, mm -hmm. all that sort of discourse just makes this really impossible. So how, what do you think we should do? How should we, how should we approach this? this sort of thing. Well, um, I, I think there is a way to approach it and it is by observing the standards which require an individualized comprehensive biopsychosocial evaluation prior mm -hmm. to the initiation of medicines. And, right. and, and that's what I'm, that's what I've been sort of railing against is the abdication of professionals for doing this proper evaluation equating gender questioning kids with transgender kids some portion of gender questioning kids surely are going to turn out to be transgender but some gender questioning kids as i was saying earlier they might be questioning sexuality gender all kinds of things and they're trying to figure out who they are and maybe we need to support that that figuring out but mm. not jump to the conclusion that they're trans and therefore, you know, are deserving of, of medicines. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the approach that has the most history behind it, which has been done in the Netherlands, has been characterized by, by those of us in this field as watchful waiting. And mm -hmm. the professionals in the gender clinic in the Netherlands, which got started before anybody else doing this work, was that we want to watch a child over time and right. see what emerges. And, you know, maybe a transgender identity emerges. And, and there, there we, we are considering, those of us who do this work, <coughs> three primary variables. Is this child insistent about this being true about them? Okay, we're, we're listening again. We're affirming. Mm -hmm. We're listening. And then are they consistent? Meaning they're unequivocating. They're, it's not like one one day they say they're male and a week from now they say they're female or they're gender fluid or what. You know, are they are they consistent? And then are they the third one is are they persistent over time? Mm -hmm. And and there is some difference of view about that. The the formal diagnosis of gender dysphoria requires six months of persistence, which is mm -hmm. not always met. Uh, in a strict way by those who want to go to a gender clinic um, with a child that's just a, asserted a, a gender difference. Um, I, I think six months is like really skimpy. You know, mm -hmm. I, when I'm giving lectures, sometimes I say, you know, persistence is not three weeks, you know, like, yeah. but what is it then? And, and, and in some of the standards, we have we've gone back and forth on this. It's it it's recommended that it be longer than six months, more like a year or two years. Mm -hmm. When I when I say things like that, some of the people on the far left say you're you're gatekeeping. You know, right. you're you're well, yes. Is that bad? I mean, what I'm trying to do is is figure out what's right for a child. I don't want right. them send them on a on a pathway for having irreversible physical changes if if they are essentially what we call in science a false positive. Someone right. who seems to meet criteria of a certain thing, and then therefore we give them this, this intervention. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's now growing evidence, uh, and it's not been collected um, systematically yet, but that, that the rush to medicalization is, gonna, is going to result in more young people who will think better of their decisions and detransition in the future. Right. That's another yeah. controversy now is like some of my colleagues wanted to dismiss the, the idea that there were going to be a significant number of people who would, who would change course, you know, in the future. But, mm -hmm. but you, you go on Reddit, there's, there's groups on Reddit of detransitioners, 30,000 people. Yeah. And that's not, that's a not 
that's not an insignificant number of people. No. And, so and- it's an, it's, it's interesting because the, the, it seems that the very same concern that would want, that would cause people to want to affirm gender identity and, and push for transition should be animating their, their concern for potentially making those mistakes and pushing too far. It seems yes. like it should be the same, that exact same compassion that's motivating these things. Thank um, you. Thank you, Angel. And, and I said as much, um, I, was, I was with some others, I was on a, an episode of 60 Minutes a year ago that mm. um, it, it originally was conceived as a, a, a show to talk, an episode to talk about uh, this issue of detransitioning. And there was a hue and cry in the trans activist community that CBS shouldn't, shouldn't do that show. Mm. And there was an effort, in fact, to, to cancel it, essentially. Uh, yeah. including lobbying executives at, at CBS, uh, yeah. you know, and, and I, I'm not a fan of censorship. Okay. And, and also I think as I've, as I've illustrated, I'm going to keep speaking out about what I think is going on and what's true. And I don't think people should be silenced, you know, that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of, of cancel culture. You know, mm-hmm. I think we still live in a society that has uh, thrived with free speech. It causes problems, too, because we allow people that we don't like what they say, but we yeah. allow them to speak, too. But that's yeah. that's inherent in our democracy, I think, and given it as a constitutional uh, protection. Yeah. But um, well, that's the only way to know it's working. Is if you're hearing right. stuff that you can't stand, <laughs> uh, right, right, and yeah. and 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 some of the journalists who who talk to me, uh, some of them actually regularly, are dismayed by the idea that you know we shouldn't have discussion about these things. Well, of course we should have discussion about these things, and yeah. and I have from the get go said, you know, uh, anybody who's who's detransitioned, transitioned, and detransitioned deserves compassion. You know, and and I, for one, want to learn from whatever mistakes might have been made, if they were mistakes. I mean, if it's a sincere journey, eyes open, you know, full consent, um, Mm. and everybody said, okay, this is the best we can do right now, let's do this. I mean, that's one thing. But if someone is sort of rushed through the process and, and encouraged to adopt this pathway uh, before they've gone through a thorough exploration, I'm, I'm worried that the risks yeah. of regretting this later are going to be higher. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, before we get to the last question that we ask every guest, I, I think just in the spirit of, of, of fostering this better conversation and, and unifying the discourse or, or opening, it, opening it up more, uh, what's one thing that you think either side of this sort of debate can do to better understand their opponent or to better understand the perspective of the people they're opposing? Uh, listen to the concerns on all sides, mm. you know, and, and they're embodied in individuals. Uh, and those individuals might be um, trans people, gender questioning kids. It might be parents. It might be providers uh, of, of all different types. Uh, they might be political leaders. You know, listen to listen to all the sides uh, of the, of the discussion. Mm. Have uh, in in your parlance a fair and open conversation about what's true. And yeah. if you don't know what's true, then then be open to finding the truth. Uh, mm. And as elusive as it may be, uh, let's all find the truth together. And let's be let's be civil. Let's be compassionate. As you pointed out in this conversation, Angel, I don't, I don't hear a lot of people saying, I don't want to do what's best for children. You know, right. like nobody says that. <laughs> right. you know, it's like, right. no, well then let's figure out. And maybe it's what's best for an individual child might be different than what's best for another child. Okay. And, and, and if you, if you presume, well, if one presumes that that they know what's best for every child, I'm starting to doubt their their objectivity. Mm-hmm. You know, like how can you assume you know what's best for every child? I don't. 
I mean, I do this work and, and when I'm first encountering a, a, some parents or a kid, I don't assume I know what's best for them. I want to find right. out uh, and, and I want to have conversation, meaningful and open conversation. I have some kids who just are delighted to have that kind of conversation. And mm-hmm. other kids who just like, no, don't ask me anything. You know, I just, this is me. I'm, I'm, you know, just give me what I want, you know? And then in some cases they become kind of militant, even though I'm very nice, you know, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm, I, you you can see I, if I'm asking a question, it's not yeah. with, with any malevolence. I, I just want right. to know. Uh, mm. So it's a really hard subject. And because the experiences of different generations has been so different, you know, the generation of parents of adolescents now was very different with gender and sexuality when they were growing up yeah. than it is for their kids. So let's recognize that maybe we are coming at this from our own experience and, and, we're, and we don't fully understand what the experience is of everyone else. And we need to, to, to be able to uh, be in conversation with each other. Yeah. So Erica, we, um, I would love to talk to you more. I want to be mindful of your time, but we, we ask the same question of all our, all our guests in closing. And it is, you know, our focus at FAIR is to provide what we call a pro-human approach to the issues of the day. And of course, the issues that we spent uh, this afternoon talking about. I would love to get your your feeling on what does pro-human mean to you? How do you resonate with that phrase? And how would you advise everyday people who might be watching or listening to this, how they can be more pro-human in their approach to these things? Well, you know, I have thought long and hard about uh, part of the answer that I'm going to give you, which is the importance of empathy. Mm -hmm. That um, if we don't have empathy for others who are different than us, um, it's hard for us to understand uh, what their experience might be and how it might be different than ours. And I think too many people uh, stop short of being as empathic as they could be to to the life circumstances of someone else. In today's society, we talk about privilege and, uh, and how that can result in us having blinders. And, and I will tell you, given all the boundaries that I've crossed in my lifetime, uh, many, um, which is another conversation, by the way, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, I've been schooled in differences and, uh, and chastened by recognizing my own limitations in understanding differences. And I continue to be impressed by individual differences, as I implied earlier by my comment about that. And I think there is a need that I think we all have to try to have the simple truth. And sometimes the truth isn't as simple as we would like it to be. And so the way to, to move towards the truth, I think, is to... Is to, uh, to <laughs> To, to have empathy for other people. There's a, there's a well, re- often repeated um, a dictum from, I think it's from Native American tradition, which is um, don't judge someone else unless you've walked two miles in their moccasins. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, uh, that was beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Erica Anderson, for joining us on Fair Perspectives. It's my pleasure, Angel, and I hope other people will find this helpful. I hope so, too. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Fair Perspectives. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating and review. You can also access exclusive podcast content, such as Q&As and bonus episodes, by visiting us and signing up at fairperspectives.org. For weekly FAIR news and opinion pieces by members of the FAIR community, visit our Substack at fairforall.substack.com and tune in to FAIR News Weekly wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to join or support the pro-human movement, visit us at fairforall.org slash join us. Thanks again and see you next time.